Okay, so we're going to move on to the last speaker in session three, um, Dr. Alex Shalek from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And, and before I, I, I turn this over to, to Alex, I, I, I have to say that at, when the committee was putting this together, we, we asked Alex to, to really uh, include in his talk also um, some of the, the pitfalls and challenges, often when we talk about new technologies, we, we tend to focus on all of the, the positive things. So um, if Alex sounds a little bit negative, it's because the committee really drove him to, to do this. So um, the, the, the title of his presentation is Identifying Rationally Modulating Cellular Drivers of Enhanced and Diminished Immunity. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me. I've changed my slide title a little bit to translating single cell genomics to the clinic based on what we're doing. And it's always fantastic when you get up right after somebody who gets to give the inspirational vision talk and then you're supposed to uh, talk about all the things that are wrong with the technologies in the universe. So I'm going to show you some things that I hope you uh, think are wonderful science, but at the same time highlight the things that we were very conscious of as we were doing these assays uh, because they're usually hidden behind all the magic of uh, beautiful plots. So. At a high level, my lab is interested in how balance is achieved in the immune system. I'm sure I don't have to convince this audience that balanced immune responses are incredibly important. If you have over-exuberant immunity, you can become susceptible to allergy or tissue damage. And if you have hypoimmunity, you can become susceptible to um, opportunistic infections and the outgrowth of things like cancers. What we do in my lab is we develop and apply technologies that help us understand what constitutes immune homeostasis. What are the deviations that are induced by disease? And to think about how to rebalance the system therapeutically or prophylactically buffered in the first place. So if we're developing and applying tools, the question really becomes, why do we need new tools? What are the issues? Well, uh, strangely enough, my postdoc led me to work with the V for Give, uh, who convinced me that we could find everything in the universe through genomics, because we could take a set of cells that had been exposed to one perturbation and then another, look at all of the genes that were expressed in these two tubes, and then use integrative analyses to get a sense of what was driving the response to this particular perturbation. The only problem with this is that when we do this, we make the fundamental assumption that every single cell in this tube is the same and responding in the same way. And in a number of experiments that I did with Aviv, every time we went back to validate these observations, what we saw was tremendous heterogeneity. There were differences in the levels of RNA across seemingly identical cells or in the activities and abundance and location of proteins. When we tried to kill cancer cells by knocking out essential genes, sometimes we killed 90%, sometimes 50%, sometimes very few. And even when we took what people thought of as incredibly uniform cells, naive mouse T cells, and sorted them tightly and put them in a constant bath of cytokines, we saw this tremendous variability in differentiation. And so while well, some people might be excited to see that 40% became the cell type that they wanted, the real question is, why is there the 60% over here and what is the spread? So in thinking through this, we sort of came to the conclusion that there were three possibilities here. The first is that we could be making very bad measurements, which hopefully I will convince you is not the case, that there are still technical concerns. The second is that there could be some stochasticity to biology, sort of a quantumness to it. And I come from chemistry and physics, so I like this idea uh, of intrinsic noise and sort of the cell just being just so at the moment when we measure it in a very uh, Heisenberg sense. But the last and most tantalizing hypothesis is that this variability that I'm showing you right here actually represents some structure that we don't fully appreciate. In the same way that all of you are in this room, and I could assume that all of you are identical, if instead I got to know each and every one of you, began to profile things about you, I might be able to find patterns, like what agencies you're associated with, that some of you are academic, um, and even maybe some nuances of how you were trained. So at the time, what seems like eons ago, but was actually only about five years ago, almost six, we did what was an incredibly small pilot experiment, where we asked, could we take cells, separate them out, profile their gene expression independently, and through finding patterns, identify uh, what might be driving these differences, and treat variability almost like a non-genetic per uh, perturbation? So this was the first data that we ever generated um, when I was a postdoc with Rahul Satija, who spoke yesterday, uh, working with Aviv as well. And I just want to show you what the data actually looks like, because I think in a lot of the plots, we lose sight of what we're actually measuring. So this is what gene expression looks like in a single cell. Here are 18 single dendritic cells hit with LPS. Here are three populations. I'm showing you IGB traces where these are exons and introns in between. And what I want you to see is that single cells are very noisy here in blue. Populations look very clean and reproducible. But fortunately, if you don't put any cells into your tube, you don't get any reads mapping to the mouse genome, which is good. So if we try and get more quantitative and look at the average expression of these genes by looking at the density of reads over the gene body relative to all reads, 
Well, we walk away as something that looks like this. Our populations right here are very reproducible. If we estimate gene expression for one gene in one population, which is a point versus another, we get beautiful correlations. With single cells, we see tremendous variation. Some genes are shared, but some cell genes are different. If we go and look at what these genes are, what we discover is that they make sense. The ones that are on the diagonal that are common are enriched for ribosomal and housekeeping elements, whereas the ones that are off diagonal are actually immune response genes, suggesting that this may actually be something very interesting to look at. But you have to be careful when you do this. Nobody ever sequences one individual cell, and it's something that we gloss over. What we do is we take one cell, we amplify it up a million times, and we pray that in the process we have not distorted our original copy so bad that we've uh, gotten to the point where we can't understand anything anymore. So you could imagine that in a Goldilocks scenario, that for interferon beta, in this cell I missed my transcript, in this uh, one I amplified it too much by PCR, and here I got it just right. This is where orthogonal techniques come in to help you validate your observations. And so we spent a lot of time using orthogonal approaches like RNA fish and in situ imaging technology to convince ourselves that what we saw by sequencing matched what we would see in our real cells. So genes that were expressed by all cells by sequencing showed up in all of our cells by RNA fish. And genes where we saw, okay, sorry. And genes where we saw a thousand fold variation between neighboring cells, we saw exactly the same thing in RNA fish with one cell that would have a thousand copies next to it, one that would have none. And so what this told us was that we were measuring biological variation. But the question was, is this random or is it structured? And as you've probably been convinced over the past few days, what made this so exciting is that it turned out there was structure within it. In this first set, we identified among 18 that three of our cells were different. It turns out that if you pipette too aggressively, you force your cells to differentiate because this is bone marrow derived dendritic cells. And even though this is a subtly uh, different population, we were able to very cleanly pull it out. We found that other axes of variation that were more continuous were also useful. And the reason for this is that you could look at correlated gene expression and map these to cell circuits with the idea that if the genes were all up in one cell, they probably had a common upstream driver. Um, and we showed that through going back and doing perturbations of some of the transcription factors we thought drove this module. All right, so this is very quick. But the reason that I bring this up and the reason that I've come back to it is that the fundamental idea of everything we're going to do is hidden within this which is the idea that we are looking at variation across our cells and then trying to find structure in that variation to tell us something about the biology. So you have to think about that every time you see an analysis. What are you actually looking at? It's really you're looking at variation, you're trying to find structure. In it. So hidden within this is the way in which my lab likes to approach systems. When we see them, we see them as these simplified representations uh, that, are, that look something like this. The first thing that we always want to understand are what are the cells that comprise our system? This is the periodic table that Aviv just brought up. When you have different elements, where I come from, we think about different uh, numbers of neutrons and protons and electrons. The question is, what are the characteristics that are the equivalents for cells? What are the things within those cells that differentiate their uh, phenotype? These are all the things that exist sort of in isolation. A natural thing to say is what happens in the environment that a cell exists in? How does the impact of interactions with other cells influence its phenotype? And most importantly to me, since we are complex multicellular organisms, how does all of this integrate together to drive the system as a whole? And I think that these are really cute things to draw on Illustrator. And to tell you the truth, I had a lot of fun with this. Um, but I don't think that this is a good way of thinking about the universe unless you have the tools that enable you to get this resolution. So what my lab does is it develops tools to get at this. So methods of doing massively parallel single cell RNA sequencing so we can identify uh, our cellular composition. Ways of measuring multiple different variables at once so that we can get those characteristics. Ways of controlling and leveraging the microenvironment uh, even within the same sample, to get a sense of how a cell's decision is based upon its local microcommunity. And then simple things where we really try and understand how the other cells that you're dialoguing with change your perception. So I know this is broad. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And I'm going to give you one example in the context of biology to show you how we iterate and improve technologies, but also to show you all the pitfalls that can occur if you're not careful. So. Um, I'm going to start with identities. I know we brought up some of these single-cell technologies yesterday, so I'm going to do this very briefly. But the first thing you always want to know when you're thinking about your single-cell data are what are the cells that comprise your system. So going back to when we started doing some of this work, we were sort of in this regime right here, where we had these plate-based methods and a couple early adopters in the microfluidic space that helped you get to hundreds of thousands of cells so that you could look at all of the genes, so really go unbiased. But we really didn't have anything that was out here. This is where we went back to the drawing board as engineers. We started off with the idea that in our first instance, we'd sort cells into multi-well plates. These look small to me originally because they have 96 wells. The volume is in the microliter regime. And so you say to yourself, if you come from physics or uh, chemistry, this is you know 
actually pretty high throughput. I can do a 384 well played, it feels really good. And then you hear Aviv say, we're going to do 100 billion cells, and you realize that that's carpal tunnel syndrome um, just waiting for you. So what we realized is that if we didn't want to pipe out ourselves, we could make machines do it for us. And I come from a background in nanobiotech. Uh, that's what my PhD was in. So the idea of having microfluidics do everything for me sounded great. And so you get these beautiful chips, like this one from Fluidime, where we were an early alpha tester helping them roll out the system, where you capture a cell in a little cup right here and you divert everything else around it. And this is fantastic, save for the fact that just like in your computer, there's areas that store information, but then there are ones that pass stuff along. So the reagent buses here are huge. So you only get a, a shrinking in one dimension, not the others. And so you only get a scale of a scaling of about a factor of 10. So what we realized was that if everything around the cell capture site was the problem, we just had to get rid of it. And this is where we first turned to reverse emulsions. And the idea was that these are you know, small droplets of water and oil, basically salad dressings. And so if you say to yourself, these are 60 microns in diameter, it means you're in the picoliter regime, so a thousand times smaller. So maybe you'll get a boost of a thousand. So as I'm sure was introduced yesterday, I'm sorry I couldn't be here, I was uh, at another meeting. A number of technologies have come online from us and others that have been associated with this. So DropSeq developed by uh, us in collaboration with Evan McCosco, Dave Waits, Steve McCarroll, um, Ruth Wool Satija and others uh, that basically use the idea of using uniquely barcoded beads with cells to barcode information early and go forward. A parallel effort from Dave Along Klein and Mark Kirshner called Indrop. Um, and then a commercialized variant 10X that's sort of same, same, but different that all rely upon this idea of early barcoding of cellular RNAs. Um, I will tell you that every single one of these techniques is fantastic. Anybody that tells you there is a better technique is lying to you. Uh, but I will tell you that every one of these techniques is awful. And so in certain instances, <laughs> certain techniques are great. And you know, just to give you in a nutshell what it might be, DropSeq is much better if you want to get lots of cells, but there's some processing artifacts that occur. Uh, InDrop is very good for uh, getting digital quantification transcripts and things like 10x genomics are very easy to implement and therefore are nice in sort of core facilities but don't enable the same sort of customization. We can get as nerdy as you want about this. I don't see a chalkboard, but I learned from my two-year-old how to write on walls, um, so I'm happy to do it. Um, what I'll say is that this enables incredible power. And I think that you know the first instance of this with 45,000 cells and the mouse retina sort of defining cell types from first principles, really taking a tissue and identifying what was, with, what was in it, finding the markers for it, and figuring out that this kind of made sense at an incredibly low price was awesome, though this obviously looks much less awesome and impressive based upon the talk that we just had. But it was a great starting point at the time, 2015. To some of the questions that came up, my lab not only focuses on healthy samples. I actually have a lab over at the Reagan Institute and um, appointments over at HMS and at MGH. And a lot, a lot of what we do is global health. We focus a lot on trying to understand things like HIV and TB. So when I got my lab and I went over and my colleagues started asking me things like, this is fantastic. Could you use this to figure out what the acute targets of HIV infection are? Or could you tell me what a granuloma looks like? Because we have absolutely no clue. Um, and you have this magic machine. Was this going to work? I had to unfortunately say to them, absolutely not. And the reason is that we didn't design these things to achieve the criteria that we needed for uh, global health research. So they weren't really scalable. DropSeq has multiple syringe pumps and chips and uh, microscopes to make sure it works. Ditto with InDrop. 10x lets you run about eight lanes, but it's cost prohibitive. Um, you know, they're not really portable. Hypothetically, a 10x box is portable, but I've never seen any PI that says you can take a $150,000 piece of equipment out of my lab on a plane, um, <laughs> at, least, at least where I live. Um, there are issues with capture efficiency that have to do with the way in which you mix the barcoding reagents in the cells. Um, you know, drop seek and in drop are relatively inexpensive, but 10x is not cheap. Um, and then there's some issues with the way in which you process, because droplet methods inherently are uh, serial as opposed to parallel. So in looking at this, we realized that there might be a simple solution. And we really <laughs> like simple solutions. And that was in the lab of one of our collaborators over at the Coke, Chris Love, um, and with his student, Todd Guerin. This was work done by Mark and Travis in my lab uh, with uh, Chris and Todd. And basically, Chris has this incredibly simple platform. It's a one by three uh, glass slide with a PDMS array of wells on top of it, 100,000 wells. It's basically like a big ice cube tray, but a small ice cube tray. Um, and the idea was that maybe we could get around all of the things that were awful about DropSeq, but keep all the awesome things by using something that we called SQL for at least three bad puns. So the idea is simple. You take an array of microwells, you deposit on your beads. Because your beads are now the same size as your wells, you can get a bead in every single well. 
You then come in with a bulb pipette, and literally it can be a bulb pipette deposit on your cells at low density, so on average you get one or zero. And then we seal the array with a semi-permeable membrane. And what this does is it enables us to add a very strong lysis buffer to neutralize any pathogen, liberates the RNA from the cells so that it's next to the bead, but it gets trapped inside because the pores are small enough that only the lysis buffer can get in, but the RNA can't get out. Um, as you probably saw yesterday, the standard way of testing these things is to mix together two species like mouse and human. So this is what a species mixing plot looks like. And the idea is that if you use uh, your technology and you look at the number of human transcripts or mouse transcripts you get for any given cell barcode, awesome things are here. Things where you do good at capture, but uh, you don't do great at, um, at getting single cell resolution are here. And things that you don't show in public are here. I'm just going to show you what we do in public, which is um, after many optimizations and iterations, where really you can see that for every barcode, we're either mouse or human with only a couple doublets in the middle. Uh, this doesn't only work on cells, it works on, um, you know, it works on cell lines, so you can see how it compares to things like DropSeq or 10X. Uh, it works um, using this incredibly simple array technology, a simple clamp, which we made out of metal. Now we 3D print these things. And actually, now we primarily use a lean green, uh, lean mean grilling machine from George Foreman because it will seal many of our arrays at once. And literally, we use it for that. Um, but it literally goes anywhere. It works on complex samples, so you can take blood um, and figure out the cellular components of it. And we can see when we image ourselves on our array uh, using antibodies that are labeled with different fluorophores and plotted as though it's flow cytometry, good correspondence to what we get when we sequence the same array. So we see 9% CD8s by our quasi-flow assay versus 7.3 here. And we see 47% you know, monocytes here and 49 here. But we discover populations by sequencing that we would have missed based on the panel we pick, like dendritic cells. Um, it works on incredibly low input samples. We spent a lot of time getting these large LUCA packs and then throwing away everything but 20,000 cells. So what we realized is that we could work with incredibly posse-cellular samples, whether they were small gut pinch biopsies right here, where we could now look at adjacent uninflamed or inflamed regions and ulcerative colitis, like Aviv just brought up, or even things that you would have never thought about looking at before, like cerebral spinal fluid, where we can literally take a tap, deposit on the array, and instead of saying that you can't look at what's in it, we can now tell you about the total cellular composition um, what's going on, and even in some cases tell you about the response uh, to therapy in longitudinal studies. Um, I will say that at this point, it's fantastic that it works in my lab. The question people always ask is, does it work outside of my lab? Um, we need to go back because I clicked through way too many slides. This is why I don't like using other tools. Bear with me. Can you advance me to the next slide back there? No, to 27. Thank you. Sorry about the technical difficulties. That's 28. <laughs> the answer in a nutshell is yes. <laughs> I am not sure where my slide has gone. Um, we, have now, we have now run this on six different continents and over 100 labs on everything from uh, tuberculosis in South Africa to uh, malaria in Southeast Asia to um, let's see if it comes up, uh, to vaccine studies with partners down here at the NIH, to um, everything that you might imagine. And so what I wanted to do, because this is a, a talk about uh, environmental exposures, is I was going to tell you very quickly about one of the studies on this slide that looks very beautiful. Um, that one right there that we can see. Thank you. Yes. So, so we'll do it from this mode really quickly. What I'll say is that we've done everything from uh, these longitudinal CSF studies that are showing you to multi-site uh, hepatitis studies, uh, looking at liver FDAs, to uh, malarial studies in Thailand, to leprosy in Brazil, uh, to TB and HIV. Um, we've done a lot of different systems, so I'm happy to talk about it. We're fine. We'll stay here. 
So one of the ones that I wanted to show you in the context of this and to tell you about some of the problems, 28 is good. Just let's go with it. OK. So one of the uh, problems that I want to talk about is uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, which is something that I have a hard time saying and never thought about until my postdoc, Jose Ordovas, brought it to me. Um, but he had a personal connection to it and wanted to understand a little bit more what was happening in this disease. Um, as you may be well aware, this is what your sinuses look like. Uh, for some of us, when we get acute or seasonal allergies, we can begin to get mucus in production here that uh, leads to the sense of congestion that we get. But for about 12% of the population, you can get persistent inflammation, which can lead to, um, in severe cases, uh, loss of smell, cough, and the formation of nasal polyps. So what causes CRS? Well, um, unlike what I was showing you earlier, it's sort of a prototypical type 2 immune disease, where its responses to helminths, allergens, and venoms, the primary effector is the epithelia, it produces these primary effector cytokines that then go act on secondary effector immune cells, which then go um, and activate uh, other cells through the production of cytokines. And what's so interesting about this is that when you look at it, there's actually the opportunity for a feedback loop here. So you can see that these secondary instructors actually can act back on the epithelia. So you could imagine that what we're seeing in allergy is maybe an instance of the signaling cascade gone haywire. So what's even more interesting about CRS is that it's actually two diseases. So normally in people, when you have a challenge, like uh, you come to my house, you sniff my dogs, you get a little bit of inflammation, and then it resolves when you leave my house. In people that have CRS, you actually have two different outcomes. You can either get inflammation that doesn't fully resolve, or you can get the formation of these polyp-like structures, which are a morphological change in the tissue. And so the question that we had is, if you have one type of inflammation that's occurring here, how do you get such distinct remodeling? And so what do we know about what happens in CRS? Well, if we look back to lithographs from the 1920s, what we can see is that normally your nasal epithelium is a pseudostratified tissue with basal cells on bottom, your stem cells, and these uh, cells on top. Um, and at the bottom, I don't know why the laser pointer isn't working, but at the bottom you can see what the tissue looks like in a polyp, and you see this influx of immune cells, including um, you know, a number of different uh, nutrients. Go forward 100 years, what do we know now? Well, not much more. We have some of the molecular markers, and we can see that there's an increase in P63 staining, which is for basal cells. And we see an expansion of it in disease, but we don't really understand what is the shift in the overall composition. So we thought that this would be a place where, um, where we might be able to use single cell resolution to get a better sense of what was happening and what was differentiating these two diseases. So a little bit that you need to know to understand this, uh, the stem cell of this tissue is the basal cell. It's P63 KRT5 positive. It differentiates into a multipotent progenitor, which then differentiates into uh, various uh, lineages that form the business end of the tissue. So the hypotheses we have were simple. The epithelial cells may be important. It may be shifts in the stem cells since we see that there are more basal stem cells. And then it may have to do with these environmental exposures. So very basic. So we went in with a well-structured uh, pipeline for actually looking at what might be driving the spectrum of the disease. And this involved taking samples across the entire spectrum of the disease from very acute um, symptoms all the way through severe disease, running it on our platform, and then getting our data. And this is something that actually usually involves lots of different people. So people that are on the clinical side that really understand the tissues, people that are involved in uh, helping with the, with the uh, sample processing, and then people on the computational side as well. And what you get at the end of the day is a beautiful Tisney that looks something like this. You can go and overlay uh, your favorite markers to get a sense of what might be the individual clusters we're seeing here. And so we see things like our basal cells, KRT5, our multipotent progenitors here, and other subsets like our T cells uh, showing up at the top right here. So if we look across the 12 individuals we profiled, we have six that, that do not have polyps and six that do. And what you see is that we see differences in composition, going back to what Aviv highlighted before, but that it's relatively consistent. And none of the populations are from any one particular individual. So diving into the epithelia, how do we make these assignments? How do we convince ourselves that these are correct? Well, we can pull out everything else and just focus on the epithelia. And what we do when we see this is a marker heat map that looks something like this. And this is how noisy the data actually is. We can see, though, if we squint, that most of the cells up here are expressing a similar set of genes. It includes KRT5 and P63. That we have this set of cells that are expressing our KRT8s, our multipotent progenitors, and then some more terminally differentiated cells where we get nice, clean separation. We can focus in a little bit more to try and make sure that these clusters are basal cells and these are differentiating or secretory. And when we do, we can compare to known markers through histology and say, 
Well, these markers that we think are basal cells right here at the bottom, KRT5, show up in these three clusters. And some of these other ones right here, like KRT8, are most highly expressed in what we would think of as our secretory cells, or our differentiating uh, multipotent progenitors. We can also look at how these different populations are related to give us a good sense that actually, you know, these glandular cells are probably differentiated from these cells and that there's interesting substructure within them. We can also go compare to other gene sets that exist. This is one of the most important things. We go and we find variation in our data set. We get lists of genes, but then we have to interpret it. So very often we have to go back to what we already know to try and figure out what it is. And so here I'm showing you that we're scoring against another set of basal cells. This is from mouse, but it gives us a good sense that the clusters that we think are basal stem cells are in fact basal. We can also use computational approaches to convince us that when we think three groups are basal, that actually a computer thinks they are as well. And this is CCA, which I'm sure Rahul talked about yesterday. So the question that you might naturally have, or at least I naturally had, is canonically we think of there being one basal cell and one multipotent progenitor in that diagram I showed you. Why are we seeing three? Well, if we go look at our three clusters and we find markers for each of them, we can see that there are uh, some interesting genes that are showing up in our differentiating secretory clusters. If we go do the same thing for our basal cells, we see that a lot of the genes overlap. If we now go overlay whether or not these come from individuals that have polyps or not polyps, we see that actually that's what's driving all the separation here. So it actually looks like instead of a batch effect, which you would normally think about regressing out, that we actually have two parallel tracks here, one that's in people that have polyps and one that's in people that do not. So what we see when we contrast these uh, different populations and differential expression is that a lot of the antimicrobial function that we would normally have in these cells has been replaced by genes that are associated with tissue repair, which makes sense. It's a barrier that's breaking down and, it's, and the tissue is trying to repair itself. So what I'm hiding from you in all of this is I haven't told you what healthy tissue looks like. And the reason for that is that healthy people do not offer to go in and have uh, their sinus tissue removed. Uh, but, you know, that's a side thought. So the question that you might ask is how do we get an appropriate control? And so this is going a little in the weeds, but these are the sort of things that I was asked to do. So this is your ethmoid sinus. This is where we are. Nobody is going to let you go up in there. But there are some other regions of your sinus that are down here where maybe if you lean your head back, you could scrape it with a toothpick. And so you might say, well, this is close. If instead of going up here to the ethmoid sinus where I can get these tissue resections to get full breath, here in this lower part, I can do some scrapings to get a sense of what the tissue might look like, and this is going to be my healthy control. What you see when you do this and you do the analysis is that, the, uh, is that these scrapings in the inferior turbinate, just two centimeters apart, are an entirely different universe. So these right here are healthy inferior turbinate. These are our polyp samples uh, up here from the inferior turbinate and from the ethmoid sinus, and they look completely different. Um, what we can see is that we find interesting subpopulations, and some of the populations that we actually miss when we do resections come in very cleanly in these scrapings, like our eosinophils. So um, it's a completely different world. But what we can do is we can actually start to look at how these different regions are impacted by um, some of the signatures compare, you know, just our particular epithelial subsets between what we're seeing in the inferior turbinate of people that are both healthy and have polyps, and the ethmoid sinus where I was showing you before, people that are, have polyps and don't have polyps, but none of whom are healthy. And what we see is something that looks more like this, where we can see all of our different clusters and representation across individuals. What we can say now is if we focus on a subtype that is shared across all of them, we can ask what's changing and disease by compartment. And what we find is that in the inferior turbinate, that in healthy individuals, we see all of these genes associated with antimicrobial peptides, then get reduced down as you move into polyp, and you get this further reduction as you move further down the ethmoid sinus. And this corresponds to a change in the microenvironment of interferon alpha and gamma signaling, as you might expect from a region that sees more microbes, to one that's more IL-413 in the context of a type 2 disease. But this tells us really at the end of the day that what we're looking at is the impact of IL-413 acting strongly in this region. But this is sort of the circuitous route by which you have to think about controls and when people are giving you controls to think about what it means. So what happens to tissue composition? I showed you what's happening at, you know, between cells of a similar type, but are we shifting in abundance? What we see is there's a dramatic shift. So in those images where it looked like there were more basal cells, there are actually tremendously increased numbers of them. So we go from about 10 to 15 percent in the non-polyp samples in the ethmoid sinus all the way up to 30 to 70 percent in the polyp samples. If we go look at what the diversity of the tissue is, we see a dramatic reduction in the diversity as uh, shown here with Simpson's index when we move from non-polyp to polyp with really this major expansion of basal cells. 
And this isn't just that we've bifurcated it. If we look at what a pathologist would tell us is the rank order of their pathology and compare it to the diversity, we see this very strong, nice correlation. So this is all single cell RNA sequencing. It's all on a comparison of six versus six. How do you convince yourself this is right? You go validate by a lot of orthogonal methods. So you take markers and you do flow, cytome or flow cytometry to show in many individuals that the shift and increase in basal cells relative to all epithelial cells holds true for a larger cohort. You then say to yourself, in all of this, I've dissociated my tissue, so it's possible that I'm losing a lot of information. Let me go do in situ staining to prove that I'm seeing this. So we see an expansion of our basal cells right here um, in polyp samples and a reduction in glands right here relative to the glands that we're seeing here. We can also take bulk RNA sequencing data and use our single cell data to deconvolve it and show that in our non-polyp samples on this side, we have a much more glandular and differentiated phenotype that goes more basal as we become increasingly uh, diseased. We can also go and take publicly available data sets from other publications, deconvolve them, and show that the same holds true. So why does this arise? Uh, epigenetics came up before, but that's sort of what we see. This is a differentiation process. You're going basal all the way through. And what we see is that in a non-polyp sample, using some of these pseudotime algorithms, that we have this nice differentiation trajectory here through space. Whereas in the non-polyp sample, or sorry, in the polyp sample, it looks a little different. There's a little less density here and a little less density here. If we plot that by looking at sort of the mass along this arrow, what we see is that actually in our non-polyp samples, our basal cells are much more basal and our differentiated cells are much more differentiated. Whereas in the polyp, it's sort of all stuck in the middle. So why do they get stuck? Well, if we compare what's happening in our non-polyp polyp samples and look at the genes, we find that the signature that came up before that IL-413 is acting incredibly strongly, even on our basal cells. And so what's so surprising about this is that we know that IL-413, these environmental signatures, can act on differentiated epithelium. But what I'm telling you here is that even our basal cells are changed in their phenotypes, so the stem cell of the tissue. What that, we can see that if we compare IL-413 targets across polyp and non-polyp. We can see that it's shifting canonical differentiation pathways like Wint and Notch. And this is incredibly evocative of what we're seeing in multiple different systems now. Um, and across multiple different labs where it seems like there's a lot of dialogue between the immune system and stem cells that sort of primes them to respond for future events. So how is this uh, memory being stored? Well, it's not in the RNA because RNA is ephemeral. You can go back and look at the epigenetics, looking at accessible chromatin, and what we see are that in our non-polyp samples, we have all of these stem-like factors, our SOXs. And in our polyp-like samples, when we focus on our basal cells, we see this strong enrichment for inflammatory motifs. This holds true when we go look at the RNA as well. So it's not just the accessibility is different. It's also that the gene expression is different. And so you might ask, how do we test this? How do we prove that this is causative? Well, this is another place where you need to go back to a model. And so you will see probably in one of your uh, grantees applications, somebody proposing to use something like an organoid or the like. So we went to our organoid, which are these air liquid interfaces where you take basal cells, you grow them out, and you create a tissue. And so does this really replicate what you would see in vivo? Is it a good model? Uh, kind of. If you squint at it, your air liquid interface looks kind of like your in vivo tissue in both instances. And when you sequence it, you get things that look basal, things that look secretory, things that look ciliate, and then you get some weird hybrid phenotypes that we don't really understand. Um, so does this maintain the defects that you would see in polyps? The answer is no. In every case where we compare these organoids that are made, in this case, AL, air liquid interfaces from people that uh, have polyps and not polyps, they look identical. There's no statistically significant difference. And we see that there's no shift in the percentage of cells that are generated, even when we add these exogenous cytokines. And so this might be very disappointing to people unless you sit back and you think about how you make organoids, which is that you take cells, you grow them in incredibly strong wind and other polarizing conditions. So you could totally imagine the way in which you set up the organoid would erase your phenotype. So if that's the hypothesis, then if you just take basal cells, even if they're cultured and they're not put into this strong environment, and you hit them with IL-4 or 13 or a combination, you should see that the shift is maintained. It works beautifully. So if you take people that uh, do not have polyps, you hit them with IL-4 or 13, you get about 500 induced genes. If you take polyp uh, basal cells and you hit them with IL-4 or 13, you get about 40. You see that there's some overlap here. But most importantly, if you look at what's already up in baseline at polyps, so already elevated in that culture before you hit it with 4 and 13 versus what comes on in 4 13 in a polyp, it's 132 genes. So what I'm really telling you is that genes like beta-catenin, a master Wnt transcription factor that are normally low and induced by this, are already elevated and can be elevated even higher in disease. So this really says that you know, there is this environmental exposure acting on stem cells, changing the tissue. So you might ask yourself, can you actually protect humans? 
uh, by blocking this, can you help reset balance? And so this is that crazy n of one experiment that we got to do. We now have n of three. Because we can work with such low samples, we were actually able to get somebody to come into our lab, um, lean their head back, and scrape their polyps, which dangled down a little bit. And just like you might have taken a cheek swab in high school biology and put it on a slide, now instead of doing that, we're just doing single cell genomics. And we can show you what they look like both pre-treatment with an anti-4 or IL-4, IL-13 antibody. It hits a shared sub uh, unit or shared uh, subunit of the receptor for both. We can look pre-scraping, post-scraping, and they actually got their polyps removed, so we even have that. And I'm just going to focus on the stem cells so we can see if blocking this environmental perturbation is bringing it back. And what you see is that our basal cells still look basal by their transcription factors. But what we see is that actually you see a dramatic shift in some of these um, basic um, differentiation pathways like WINT, and a lot of the inflammatory transcription factors that were highly elevated before treatment have now gone down. You see that some things like beta-catenin don't fully reset, so we're not all the way back, but this tells you that these interventions and the hypotheses that you come out with from these data can start to guide you towards the right interventions going forward. Um, and I say that with the caveat that this is N of 1 and we need a lot more. So what's really cool is this is telling us that chronic exposure to environmental uh, perturbations is basically causing responses which over time can lead to a new baseline and to a new homeostasis. So you can imagine that exuberant activation of sort of these pathways could over time lead to this gross morphological change in some individuals that we think of as polyps. And this is shown up beautifully in some work by Shruti Nayak now at NYU and Elaine Fuchs at Rockefeller, uh, first looking at it in sort of inflammation in the skin, where actually it has a good effect. So what I was really trying to show you in all of this is that you can use these technologies to really probe disease in ways that you couldn't previously. That you find that epithelial cells, which would have been hard to sort using conventional markers because we don't have them from subsets, we can figure a lot about their diversity and how it's changing, that we find interesting interactions that we might not have thought of before, and that our site of disease is actually something that we might not have previously appreciated, that here it seems to be stem cells. And so we come away with this model where in, the, in sort of this uh, acute activation, you see a shift which, if you don't fully resolve, can lead progressively to uh, more elevated disease. There are lots of cool things that happen in this story and all the other subsets. I'm going to skip it because of all the technical difficulties in the time. Um, and I'm just going to say that as great as this is, and as much as you know, I'm always happy to put a paper out there and to hear people say great things about it, all it tells me is all the things that we did wrong. We did a very bad job of capturing a lot of information ourselves. We weren't getting all the cytokines and transcription factors that we wanted, so it led us to develop uh, new approaches to do better molecular biology. We're losing some of the beads that came out of our array, so we went back to the drawing board and built some new beads. We're talking about IL-413 and their secretion, but we're not measuring it, so we've started working on different ways of measuring those proteins from our cells. Um, we want to understand things about the clonality. Is it one particular T cell or is it all T cells? And as we generate this data, we need new computational approaches to help us figure it out. Because space was so important, it suggests new areas to develop technologies. And finally, I'll say that what I'm really telling you about are interactions. And so what we really need to think about is not just you know, this bucket of parts, but how the parts are put together, because it's not random. And so we've been working on technologies to go after this. And I think that actually building tissues is going to be one of the most important things to figure out how it all comes together. Um, I'm going to thank my lab, because they're awesome. Um, and because I don't do any work anymore, they do all this beautiful science. I'm incredibly appreciative of them every single day. Um, I'm going to thank everybody really quickly. I went very quickly through all the single cell methods, but that was with DropSeq was with Aviv, Oni Basu at Chicago, Rahul, who was here yesterday, Evan McCosco and Steve McCarroll, both at HMS, Dave Waits, Hankin Park, both at Harvard, and Josh Staines, uh, with whom we did the retina, Chris and Todd we did seek well with, and then uh, Nora, Dan, and Josh were our collaborators on the CRS. Um, there are many more people to thank, and I want to thank all of my funders who have been very generous and hopefully will continue to be. Uh, thank you, and sorry about uh, running over all the technical difficulties. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you combinatorial indexing and things like Jay Shendra is doing where we essentially eliminate and use the cell as the encapsulation mm -hmm. and uh, move away from beads and from encapsulating. So it's a fantastic question. Um, there, are, there are sort of two major approaches, as you point out. One is to 
barcode your beats, usually through split pool, or to barcode your cells or your nuclei through split pool. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about split seek or uh, sci seek or whatever your favorite variant is. Um, they both have pros and cons. Um, these split pool based approaches where you're working on cells, um, you usually have to fix the cells and do reverse transcription and all of your ligations in an intact cell, which makes you know, the molecular biology there a little less efficient. What it does let you do is it lets you work on incredibly large numbers of cells and to get you know, sort of this power to look at entire organisms, which you could never imagine doing in the other sense. Um, but it does have a couple drawbacks in the sense that it's not very efficient for low inputs of cells, and it really doesn't let you get the best capture on your particular sample. So on the other side, you have the methods where you've barcoded your reagents. And what's nice about that is that you can use very nasty lysis buffers, rip the cells apart, get rid of all the secondary structure, really capture the RNA, and use your best molecular biology to improve your efficiency. And at a certain point, there's a trade-off because I want to go back to what I said in the beginning, even though it was sort of hidden. All we're really looking at is covariation expression across cells. So the sparser the representation gets, the harder it is to tease out the biology. There are things that you can do with numbers, as we brought up. And so the nice thing about the uh, split seek and the size seek approaches is that you can get such high numbers that you really can start to tease out what are false negatives and what are true negatives. Whereas um, in the other approaches, really, when you have clinical samples and you only have one shot and you really need to get as much information as possible, it's a place where they really shine. But there's still room to improve there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alex. <laughs>